me. Be careful out here. Be careful out here. What are you doing out in the dark? That's the question. Because I tell you, a lot of evil stuff happens in the dark. A lot of bad stuff happens in the dark. But God said he's going to bring everything to the light. He is going to bring everything to the light. Don't run from him. Don't run from God. Because everybody's going to have to stand before him at the end of their day. Don't run from him because everybody's going to have to stand before him. Everybody, including you. Your soul. You have one. You have a soul, I tell you. You're not just flesh and blood. You're not just bones. But you're a spirit. You're a soul. Your body, soul, and spirit. And I want to ask you, is your soul with God right now? Or is your soul with the devil, Satan? Is your soul going to heaven? Or is your soul going to hell? I care about you, that's why I'm out here. Because I don't want you wandering in the darkness no more. I don't want you in that sin no more. And God does not want you in that sin anymore. God does not want you to perish. God loves you so much. God cares about you so much. His name is, his name is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is his name. And he lives. He lives and he can revive your soul. He can raise up your soul. So because he rose. Not like those other gods. He's the true life to your soul. He can give life to your spirit. You don't have to continue to run after the drugs, after that alcohol, after that lust, after that darkness. You can get out of the darkness. And come into light. You must understand that you're spiritual. And the word of God is powerful to save life. I do not want to speak death on your life. I do not want to speak death on you. But I want to speak life upon you. Because you are, you are praying. He wants to save your soul. He wants to bring you to Him. He wants to take you out of that fire. There's fire. Be careful. He wants to take you out before you burn. Before you be in that fire in the judgment. In the wrath of God. Get out of the wrath of God. It is terrible. Do not get into it. God is righteous and holy, and He must do us true. Are you being Jesus real with real? Him? Yes, He is. Are you being real with God? You don't think so? Because God wants to keep. I think it real you need to look at the historicity of the Bible. God keeps it real. He keeps it real with me, and He wants to keep it real with you. God kept it so real that He died for your sins. He didn't die that you can live in sin. He didn't die that you have to stay in the darkness. He died to take you out of that darkness and bring you into the light. Get out of the darkness. Do not stay in the light. Be in the light. The light is Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. The light is Jesus. He's the only light in this world. Jesus Christ is the only light in this world that we have. This world is just pure darkness. All these rappers are just speaking. They're professing with the real. Be real with Creator. Be real. I tell you, going to these clubs, going to these bars, it ain't real. It's a fake life. It ain't a real life. Come with God, that's real. Following God, that's real. Being with your Creator, that's real. Don't believe the lie from the devil. I'm going to go back to the ground where I came from. But your soul is going to live on forevermore. Think about heavenly things. Think about the afterlife. Before it's too late. Before you take your last breath. Keep God first. Don't have money over God. 
Don't have nothing over the creator. Don't have creation. All the things that were created over the creator. Because he's not going to hold you. Goodness. Hear me out. God wants to rescue you. He wants to deliver you. He can do it. He wants to do it. Just come to him humbly. Come humble before him. Don't continue to be the creator of the world. Come humbly, why? Come humble, I tell you. He took your sin so you don't have to pay for it. So that you don't have to live in it. I used to message you up. Prostitution. Yep. It's addiction. Do you really want to be addicted to that stuff? It's just going to destroy you. It's going to destroy you. Don't be a slave. It's going to kill sin. you. It's going to kill you, and most importantly, it's going to kill your soul, and you're going to go to hell. Watch out. Watch out. Watch out for it. Watch out. The Holy Scriptures say, watch and pray. Pray to the God Almighty. Look out for what is going on. Look out because judgment is coming. Jesus Christ is coming back. And he's going to bring judgment and take this earth back. He's going to bring this kingdom down. Where there's no more tears. Where there's no more sorrow. Where there's no more killing, stealing, and destroying. But where there's peace, joy, and love. It's going to be heaven on earth. I wish the best for every single one of y'all. Most of y'all are my age, and I wish the best for every single one of y'all. Because I tell you, I've been on the side of darkness, and it's not working. I've been on the side of depression, and it's not true. It's not real. I've been on the side of trying to gang bang. I joined the gang. That's not the real way. I've done it. I've kicked indoors. I could have died for what I was doing. The devil was trying to kill me. The devil was trying to steal my life. Oh, but I tell you, the devil's a liar. The devil wants you chasing everything else except for him. The devil wants you having... Amen. And my God have mercy on your soul. May Elohim have mercy on your soul. May Jehovah have mercy on your soul. May Jesus Christ give you the grace to be saved. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let me jump in. Yeah, let's see. Yeah, All right, praise God, praise God. Another beautiful evening to praise God's name here in Deep Ellum. My name is Brother John. I'm here with my brother. From Christ Forgiveness Ministries, and we're here to preach the word and spread the gospel. Amen. If you don't know what the gospel is, it comes from the Greek word euangelion, and it means the good, happy news, or as we call it, the good news. But for you to understand what the good news is, you must first realize the state of the world we're living in, and it is not good. We live in a fallen creation, and the reason we live in a fallen creation is because we've all fallen short of the glory of God, we've all sinned. We've all moved away from God's almighty holiness, his morality, and as such, we've made a mess of his place. 
And unfortunately for us, as it says in Romans 6.23, the wages of sin are death. And so when it comes to our judgment day, we would be in deep trouble for the sins that we have all committed. But fortunately, God is not just a just God. He's also a God of love and he's a God of mercy. And so in his infinite wisdom, he allowed his son to come down in human form, in the form of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ lived a sinless life. Now that might be difficult for many of you to understand because all of us have sinned in various ways. Some folks here tonight continue to sin, continue to sin without repentance. And Jesus Christ lived all 33 years of his life without a sin. People tried to find all types of things to trip him up, and yet he remained sinless. Now it's very important because he ended up becoming our sacrificial lamb. He is the opportunity, his uh, sacrifice, his uh, being tortured, his being hung on the cross is what allows us the opportunity to receive eternal life. It is a free gift from God that anyone can receive if they're willing to call upon his name and make Jesus Christ Lord of their life. And that is the good news. That is the only news ultimately that truly matters. Because at the end of our days, each and every one of us will stand before God. We'll face a judgment day when all our thoughts, words, deeds, and actions will come into being and God will judge us. And on that day, you will want to have an advocate with the Father. You will want to have Jesus Christ being there, calling for your mercy, calling for grace. And to receive that gift, you need to call upon Him and give your life to Christ. And that's what we're here today. We're here to preach the gospel to each and every one of you. But of course, here in the Bible Belt, many people are familiar with this message. They've heard the name Jesus Christ. Probably many of you, as you walked here, drove by at least a dozen churches along the way. Most people know this message. Instead, today, here in the West, people have chosen other messages. They're chasing after false idols. They're chasing after false gods. They've also moved away from Christ. They've made God, they made Christ in their own image instead of the, the image of Christ in the Bible. And as such, we're here today to call you back. We're here to call you back on the narrow path and for you to move away from the broad path that leads to destruction. And in past times down here, we talked to many idols. We know many people chased after money. This used to be my serious idol. Other people chase after beauty, that elusive beauty that each day as you live, you get a little further away from that ideal goal. But yet today we're going to preach. We're going to preach about some other gospels. There's some groups that go around. And they preach a different gospel. They believe in a different message. They believe that uh, God only cares about the Israelites. He says of the 18 nations in the table of nations, the Israelites are the only one who matters. However, we're here today to proclaim that God loves all people. And we know this because God gave them life. It says in Job 36 5. Can I say something? Yes, go ahead. All right, all right. Can I say something? Mike? I, I don't, are you a Christian? Yes. Okay, tell me, tell me a Bible verse, sister. All right. I know John 3 16. Okay, and what's John 3 16? Are you gonna? I don't, I've been burned before. And isn't it always the same? They all come to you, all innocent and sweet. But therein they show their heart. And how foolish to reject your Creator, He gives you life. How foolish to turn your back on your Father. To act as if that you just sprung up out of the ground. How insulting. But that is the state that we do live in. But I feel like in past times here, we've spoken about that enough. If you want to be foolish enough to live your life as an atheist, then you'll get your wish. On Judgment Day, you'll live apart from God. And that's all there is to it. There isn't anything more to be said. It says in Romans 1.18, they suppress the truth and unrighteousness. If you want to be unrighteous... So be it. 
I don't want that for you. I hope that they repent. But if they're so set on doing that, what can I do? We'll get to that in a minute. So as I was saying in Job 36.5, the Bible says, God, indeed, he is mighty. He despises no one. And the groups that speak out against the idea that God does not love all his children, they believe in the Apocrypha, they believe in the wisdom of Solomon. This is a verse you can bring up to them. It's a good sentiment of the beliefs in God, and I want to share with it with you. It's uh, wisdom of Solomon, chapter 11, verse 24. I understand the argument, but the, the, the challenging part there is we see other examples where Edomites who became Idumeans and then became Jews, like Drusilla. I told you about in Acts 24, 24. Well, I look back into that. Yeah. Can you tell me what she became a Jew? She became a Jew. She get, well, we, it doesn't specifically say in, that Paul almost in, the, in the Bible. Well, that's that was a, with Agrippa in Acts 26. And, that, and of course, uh, Agrippa was an uh, Edomite as well. In Josephus' work, in the uh, antiquity, antiquities of the Jews, it, it says that they that uh, John Hyrcanus conquered the the Edomites and basically forced conversion into uh, they became Jews. Kind of gave them the choice, like you either had to leave the place or become circumcised and become Jews. And so that's why it says in Acts twenty four twenty four it refers to her as a Jewess, a female Jew, just like just like he did in uh, uh, Eunice, Timothy's mother. Is referred to as a child. So and we see other examples too, like we use the example here in Acts 12, verse 22, 23. This is a different Herod. And the Herod, somebody's praising Herod like he's a God himself. And uh, and so what happens is God gets angry with him and strikes him down and he dies. And so what this is is showing us the Edomites can praise and worship God, but in that moment they choose not to do so. Now, obviously, a lot of the, the Bible, that the Edomites. That? Is that what you said? Yeah, in Acts 12, 22, 23. You bring that for yeah. And that's saying that these people can become Israelites? Well, we, we know that uh, Drusilla was, was, uh, became a Jew because it was referred to her as a Jewess. Oh, 
I'm talking about uh, what you say uh, in Acts, the Acts um, 21. And at Herod, it said that in by Josephus' works that the Idumeans, the Edomites, they became Jews. And these and their positions of power where they're overseeing the, the Jewish nation, they're not ethnic Jews, obviously, but they are Jews as far as following religion. Now, how well, saying, not how faithful Jewish. they were, that's another story, obviously. Exactly. Okay. That's but but the fact is they were perceived that way. Now, there'll be camps that would disagree with me on that, but you're going to argue with Josephus. He was an Israelite at the time. I don't have a reason to, to doubt his writing. It would be a weird thing for him to, you know, to, to, to lie about. So you believe in prophecy? I do. Can you show me a prophecy in the Old Testament okay. that everybody will become Jew? That everybody will become Jew? Or everybody can get salvation? Well... In Acts, this is in Acts 17, 30, it says every man can repent and God commands it. I'm talking about like the prophets in the Old Testament. You can probably go to Isaiah 49, 6, where it talks about the stranger. It's the makar, the Hebrew word there. Well, that's the same Hebrew word for the stranger in Acts 14. Is that? That's the same word for stranger in Acts 14. I mean, I mean Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14, yeah. The stranger become a servant of handmaids. I'd have to look it up in the in the uh, interlinear. I can't remember if it's Gare or... You know that scripture though, right? Yeah. yeah mm -hmm. the, the stranger is going to become a servant and handmaid. Yep. And those that took Israel as captives shall become Israel's captives. Yep. Is that salvation? That's a, is it salvation? Yeah. Well, accor according to the Bible... So we, we could go through like a lot of different verses on that. No, I'm just asking, but like, again, being in servitude, like yeah. being in servant and handmaid, is that, is that salvation? Well, you got to understand, as far as the Bible, we're all servants of God. No, it said that Israel, we're, all we're all literally we're all slaves to God. We're slaves to righteousness, or we'll become slaves to wickedness. But it said, right, right, right. But it said Israel is going to possess the, in the land of the Lord for servants yeah. and handmaids. So they're going to be servants and handmaids to the, to the children of Israel. Is well, that salvation? Well, salvation is being, in the, from the Christian perspective, is being free, free from sin, free from the, the wickedness of the world, free from the oppression, free from the... Uh, but I'm asking though. Being a child of, of the salvation devil. Salvation in the Bible is being saved from the enemy. Well, that, that's the, the Hebrew interpretation. And the Old Testament certainly makes that claim. It's the New Testament too. But your enemy, when you are when you are sinning, you are an enemy of God. We're not, we're not negating that. We're just making okay. a point. Like, think about uh, uh, translated slave trade. Yep. Don't the servant and the uh, master, were they in the same cell? Do they live the same way? Yeah. So when, when you read it, that there's going to be slaves in the kingdom of heaven. Do you think that that's, do you th so do you think that, that servitude in the kingdom of heaven is going to be like the transatlantic slave trade? Let's see. Revelation 18, yeah. verse 5. Let's see. Revelation 18 and 5. Dealing with the servitude that's going to be the kingdom of heaven. Right. 18, verse 5. Verse 6, I reached unto heaven. Listen to the brother. I am. Verse 6, I reached unto heaven, and God has remembered her iniquity. We're talking about Babylon. We know yep. Edom is the ruling class of Babylon the Great. Right? Yep. It said, Their sins are reached unto heaven, and God has remembered their iniquity. Right? Yep. It says, her, even as she rewarded the Jews. The devil unto her, devil before unto her work. It's to reward her even if she rewarded you. And double unto her, double according to her works, right? Okay. In the cup which she have filled. In built, the cup she have filled, right? Filled to her cup. So they have to get double of what they've done to each other, right? So not only would it be like. Uh, so not only would it be like the uh, transatlantic slave trade, yep. it's going to be like double. So whatever that translated slave trade look like times two is what the servant to or the Edomites is going to be like in the kingdom. Okay. Now the other nations, they're going to go to servant two for a thousand years, but then they're going to have their own appointed land. And it will be no more war. And they too will become under the light. Israel will be the light into the Gentiles. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But yes, yeah, slavery will be in the Bible double time of the slavery that the Israelites had to go through. No, I understand the perspective. I'll let y'all have the last word and I'm going to get back to some other preaching here. You can jump in a little bit later.
we all can agree, all oh, this is gonna pass away. Yep. Not your soul with fire and brimstone. Not your soul, man. I'm talking about this. God winked at, but now assume that you're going to make the Israelites a Gentile state of mind. Say on First John two two. Yeah, it can get a little crazy and crowded, and yeah. don't worry about that. Well, I'm going to keep preaching here since I'm I'm live streaming on the channel and. Okay. Yeah. Praise God. Like I said, if, do y'all need uh, some gospel tracks? Um, I do. If you, sure. We get, we got plenty there too. If you want. Yeah. I I just. No, that's okay. Just you can refer them to me. Or just, and just say that. Just be honest. Just say I don't know everything yet. I'm I'm learning. And that's fine. Yeah. Yeah, praise God. And praise God, always a blessing to preach the word here in public. Always a blessing to remind people of God, uh, to remind them of their creator. In Psalm Chapter 69, verse 34, it says, Let everything that moveth praise God. And then Psalm 150, verse 6, it says, Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. And oh, praise the Lord, all ye nations. Praise Him, all ye people. Now, there's some people who believe that uh, America is, is damned. It's beyond saving. There's some people who believe that it cannot change. But as long as we have breath, as long as we have life, there's always the opportunity for America to repent because there are people who believe, believe in God, the faithful. They are the ones that are keeping God, delivering his hand of providence on this nation. And whenever God speaks out against the nation, whenever he, he speaks out about the, uh, the punishment to come, God always offers the opportunity for that nation to repent. We see that in the Bible. We see that in, in Jonah. When Jonah did not want to come to the Ninevites, he did not want to uh, preach the word to them because he hated the Ninevites. They were an arch enemy. And he, so even when God called upon him to preach to them, he tried to take a ship to Tarshish, go in a completely different direction, thinking he could rebel against God. But of course, Jonah learned that God does not work that way. When God calls, you best answer. And the point of this story is when Jonah did preach the word to the Ninevites, they accepted the They repented. They covered themselves in ashes and sackcloth. And God changed his mind and withheld the punishment of the Ninevites. And we see the same example again in Sodom and Gomorrah. When Abraham and Israelite prayed. God is love. God bless you. God is love. 1 John 4, 8, 1 John 4, 16. But the question always is, John 14, 15, when Jesus says, 
If you love me, keep my commandments. And so when Jonah preached the word to the Ninevites, and the Ninevites repented, God relented the punishment. And then when Jonah, or, then with regard to Sodom and Gomorrah, it was said if they could just find ten righteous men, that they could repent. So even as wicked as Sodom and Gomorrah was, they still had the opportunity to repent. And the same thing was the case with the flood. When Noah preached the word and he was out there, had those people chose to repent, had a large enough number chose to repent, God would have withheld the flood. And again, we see the same thing, the example with the Israelites, when Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel preached words of repentance, they too could have held back the Babylonian captivity, the Assyrian captivity, and the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. And so America always has that opportunity to repent, as wicked as it may seem, and this month being Pride Month, as an example of some of the shame that carried on in Sodom and Gomorrah, that God, America, the citizens always have the opportunity to repent. That's what we're calling you here today. There are some folks who believe that America cannot repent, that it's doomed. People cannot change their hearts. They cannot give themselves to God. But that's simply not the case. America's destruction is not certain. We can pull away from the brink and people are willing to humble themselves. I'm sorry? Yeah. Go ahead. You can. You can. You can if you want. Okay. 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 So that's a just an important message to remember that that uh, we all have the opportunity to repent individually and we can influence change in America. Even though it may seem at times that we've gone too far in the wrong direction, we can pull America back if we so choose, if we're willing to humble ourselves and put God first in our lives. But the difficulty has, and one of these signs that Brother Wesley is hiding from me, but it says... Uh, does your Jesus serve your sins? And that's a difficulty that we have. A lot of people believe in Jesus. They, they believe in Christ. However, what that means to them, when it comes down to brass tacks, it means very different things. And many people choose to create a God in their own mind that will suit their sins. They're unwilling to change their ways for God, and they expect God to change for them. But of course, the problem there is that God is the creator, and we are the creation. He doesn't work for us, we work for Him. Or you can choose to reject that, and then you will receive, on your judgment day, you will you will receive a punishment that you will live away from God. And you will not want that. You will not want that at that time. And that's why we're here today to call you away from that path. Because many people through the Deep Elm streets, they come down here for things, things other than honoring God, things other than putting God first in their life. And we're here to call them away from that. We're here to call them to repentance. We're here to call them to put God first in their life and to begin reading the Word. It doesn't take too long to read the Word. You can read a couple chapters in the Bible every morning before the phone starts ringing, before the babies start crying. That's what we're here calling people to do, to put God first in their life again. Brother Wesley, let me read the verse here. Other side. Other side. The other one for the... There you go. It says, Titus 1, 16, they prefer no God, but they deny Him by their works. And many people will say they love God, but then they will act in a way that would make them think that they did not know God at all. Or they're unwilling to learn about God. But if you love God, you should be seeking out God. You should be seeking out His Word and allowing it to, to change you and shape you so that God can form you from that broken piece of clay. 
into a proper vessel that will honor him so that you will, just like us, want to evangelize the word and share it with others so that they too can receive salvation. And so they too on their judgment day won't be deceived or God won't say on them, depart from me, I hardly knew you. And rather instead he will say, come forward. My good and faithful servant. That is what we hope for you. That is what we pray for you. That's why we call you to walk away from sin in all its forms. We call you to put God first. Acts uh, chapter 4 verse 7 reads, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. In Proverbs 14, verse 14, it says, Backsliders will get what they deserve. Good people receive their reward. Many of you were raised in the church. You heard plenty of gospel music. You heard plenty of easy believers and messages. The question is, are you living your life in a way that honors God? Are you living your life in a way that if people grabbed you, you would be convicted of being a Christian? Or would people not be too sure? Would your case be thrown out for insufficient evidence? Do you know God's word? Can you preach? Scripture, if I asked you today, could you tell me three Bible verses, would you be able to do it? Or would you struggle? And if you would struggle, I'm going to I'm gonna proke you a little bit and ask you a question, where is your faith where you could not even give three Bible verses, yet you proclaim, I believe in Jesus Christ, He's my Lord and Savior, and yet I do not know His Word. And so I hope that perhaps if that is you, that was me for a good part of my life. I had to humble myself and recognize that God was not first in my life. God was fourth or fifth behind chasing after money, chasing after possessions. Thinking these things would fulfill me and sustain me. But I learned, as many of you are beginning to learn, that chasing after the worldly things would disappoint. There's never enough money. There's never enough possessions. The only thing that sustains is a relationship with your Creator, the one that gave you life, the one that loves you deeply, the one's the greatest good for you. He knew you before you were knitted in the womb. He knows the number of hairs on your head, and He wants you to serve a purpose, and that purpose is, purpose is to love Him, to so become sanctified. And we hope that you will receive that message. We hope that you will walk away from the worldly messages to say you don't have to worry about that now. There will be plenty of time for you to get right with God later. So many of my friends who had that message going up early in their lives that they, they wanted to seek out God, but they also wanted to seek out the things of the world. And they said, I'll, I'll get around that to later. But then things happened. Maybe a car accident where they were killed. Maybe a suicide. Maybe a, a drug overdose. And their days ended. They never were able to get back to God. They never were able to get that true relationship that honors God and honors them. And you are not promised tomorrow. James 4.14 says, What is your life but a vapor that appeareth for a moment in time and vanishes? I'm now in my 
in my 40s, and this is difficult for me to understand. Intellectually, as a 20-year-old, I knew that life went by quickly, but I couldn't fully understand what that meant. And many of you are living your lives in that same wasteful manner that I did. And you are not promised tomorrow there will be people who will leave these bars tonight, and they will not make it home. They will not have a tomorrow, and that is a tragedy if they are not right with God. That is a, a terrible, terrible thing. So I beg of you, if you are not right with God, to start thinking about that. If you have to leave this line, if you have to go home a little early, do that while you can. This is more serious than anything that's going to be going on or happening in this bar and club. More than any other conversation that you could have tonight is if you're not right with God, what else matters? Is there are some people walking these streets who do not believe God exists. They believe that, that God is simply a, a, a nice message that, that people tell each other to make them, them feel good and to deal with difficult times. But the problem with being an atheist is if there is no God, then everything is permitted. If there is no God, it doesn't matter what you do. You can be a good person or a bad person. It makes no difference. And it makes life meaningless. This is why the, the French philosopher Albert Camus, an atheist, said the only philosophical question is, is whether to live or not. In other words, whether to commit suicide or not. Because as an atheist, there is no point to anything. You could be the most powerful person in the world or the poorest, and in a thousand years it won't make a difference either way. But you and I know better than that. We all know deep inside that there is a God. Many people choose to reject that message for the simple reason is they do not want to humble themselves before God. As it says in Romans 1.18, they suppress the truth and unrighteousness. As simply put, is they don't want God to exist because they want to sin. They want to, they want to have a lot of casual sex. They want to make a lot of money. They want to step over some people. They want to do what's going to make them better in, in the world, make them an important man or woman. But it doesn't take much thinking to realize that there's more going on in this world. You can see the complexity of the motorcycles and the cars. You can see their, their wheels. You can see the, the windows, the doors. And you know that that didn't just come together on its own. It had to have a builder, it had to have an architect to put it together. And the same thing with these buildings. It's got its lights, it's got its glass, it's got its brick, and all those things. And in all those things and all that complexity, we know that didn't just come together on its own. And by the way, we are infinitely more complex than the vehicles or the buildings. So if it follows that they had to have a builder, they had to have intelligent design, then of course we had to have intelligent design too. A simple understanding of DNA would let you know that we had a creator. And so with that thought in mind, your search on life should be, how should I learn more about this creator? How can I put God first in my life? How can I become closer to him? Because if he gave me life, what else matters? Another issue or another a false gospel that people tell themselves is they think that God changes. They think that the standards that God set in the Bible and the Old Testament, well, that's fine for those who is 21. And, and we think differently. We've got Oh, 
now we got chapter 3 verse 19 it says for the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God or as it says in Proverbs 14 chapter 12 or verse 12 there's a way that seemeth right unto a man but in the end thereof is the way of death So that's why we're here to call you away from the ways of the world, the messages of the world that are said by the creation. Instead, we're calling you back to your creator. Is Jesus Christ the same today, tomorrow, and forever? And his word and his messages and the commandments in the Bible are the same today, tomorrow, and forever? So we're calling you to walk away from easy believism. We're calling you to honor the word of God. We're calling you to join Christians who are fighting the good fight, who are spreading the gospel. And do it in a way that truly celebrates your creator. So those words really do have meaning. That if Christ really truly is your Lord and Savior, then you should follow him and you should follow him with a smile on your face and with joy in your heart. As we give this message, we know this is a message of hope. We know this is a message that the lost needs to receive. There are many people walking these lines who are hurting, suffering. They've been they're hurt in various ways. Some people are abused as children. Some people are dealing with other issues of heartbreak. And God is close to them. God is close to the broken hearted. How's it going, brother? Let me tell you. Okay. Everyone in the line here yep. does not have a broken heart or okay. does not look like, uh, you know, everyone here wants to fucking get the dick in their pussy. God bless you. You know what I'm saying? I do, but this word is reserved for God and His holiness. I prefer not to use bad language. Can I take the mic? No, you cannot. God bless you.